The first annual Reardon IBC and Cancer Symposium proudly presents What Should Cancer Patients Eat? Your presenter, Rebecca Kirby, MD, MSRD. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm so glad we're going to get to talk about food this morning because, as Dr. Ming mentioned, it's one of those really important variables in helping the patients heal because, as you well know, you can take all the supplements till the cows come home. You can give wonderful IV therapies, but if the folks have a poor diet, it's like filling a bucket with a hole in it. So. We're going to take a look at those factors that have been shown to be factors for getting cancer, risk factors for getting cancer, which leads us to the reasonable diet for what people with cancer should eat. And we're going to look at the research of diet in relation to recurrence of cancer, which leads us to the prudent diet. And then I'm going to uh, give you a little bit about what we emphasize here at the center as far as dietary guidelines. And then just a little blurb on the power of organic. Well, it's been estimated that at least one in three cancers in Western modern, uh, the high income societies are related to food, nutrition, and physical activity or lack thereof. And it is a caveat that this is very difficult to access uh, to assess because of the long latency period for cancer development and the all the other caveat I might mention is the problem with getting a good recall from people about what they actually ate but nevertheless this international group called the World Cancer Research Fund with the American Institute of Cancer Research have been looking at factors for quite a while. Their first report came out in 1997 and then this newer report came out in 2007. And they put together a summary called Food, Nutrition, Physical Activity and the Prevention of Cancer, a Global Perspective. And what we're going to do is look at what they have put down as their outlines for convincing and probable risk factors for development of cancer uh, in this 2007 report. And I'll give you a heads up what happened between 1997 and 2007, there was a little bit of a de-emphasis on fruits and vegetables. And a part of that, of course, is the problem with reporting and getting accurate information. Um, however, fruits and vegetables still came across strong for the prevention of uh, mouth and esophageal uh, cancer. The emphasis, that, the new emphasis that cropped up in 2007 was how prevalent the risk of obesity or overweight was in uh, developing cancer. So we'll just kind of scoot through. They, they had several categories, convincing evidence, probable evidence, and then they had limited and suggestive evidence. I left those out and just stuck with the really big guns, the convincing and probable. And if you look here at colon and rectal cancer, which is the third uh, leading cancer in the United States in men and women, uh, obesity ranked as the biggest uh, uh, dietary risk factor, especially if weight circumference was greater than 47 inches in men and 43 inches in women. And once again, we see red and processed meats coming up as a risk factor. And as a protective factor, possibly calcium and calcium rich dairy foods uh, were shown to be protective for that particular cancer. Breast cancer, overweight and obesity also uh, is a risk factor. Uh, alcohol consumption at only one drink a day. Now, we've known breast feeding may be protective and there's a wonderful brand new piece of research in 2009 that shows breastfeeding may protect women who have a family history of breast cancer. These are premenopausal women. Uh, ovarian cancer risk factor may be if they're big milk consumers, three glasses of milk a day. And they're wondering if that's in part because of the lactose in milk, which breaks down to glucose and galactose. So galactose has a question mark because they think further research needs to be uh, looking into that. Uterine cancer, uh, again, uh, no 
here we go, obesity, uh, but weight gain, even within the normal range, was a risk factor. Uh, a nice thing to see is that light to moderate exercise helped to lower the risk factor even in uh, those women who did have uh, overweight or obesity as a risk factor. Esophageal cancer, weight gain with reflux, with, even within the normal range, and uh, for the squamous cell esophageal cancer, it was heavy alcohol intake as a risk factor, and <coughs> fruits and vegetables come, come through really strong to lower risk factor. Kidney cancer, again, overweight and obesity was the primary risk factor. Pancreatic cancer, obesity comes up again. Uh, increased weight circumference greater than 36 inches in women was particularly significant and red meat cooked at high temperatures came through for men and processed meats also as a risk factor. Uh, for prostate cancer, uh, obesity was related to poor survival and aggressive uh, prostate cancer. So, guess what? I think Walter Willett summed it up the best. If you don't smoke, the single most important thing you can do to prevent cancer is to keep your weight under control. So, let's talk a little bit about weight management. Um, the the uh, World uh, Research Council also said that uh, increased risk begins with the weight gain, stay within the normal range. And just to remind you guys, normal range is a healthy body mass index, or BMI, between 18.5 and 24.9. That's a healthy BMI. Okay, and BMI, you asked, that's the kilo weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. They also recommend that people not eat those calorie dense foods, you know, your fried Twinkies, that have more than 65 to 80 calories per ounce. Uh, and then there was a discussion about soda consumption and sugary drinks promote weight gain. Well, they were right about that. Americans are really in love with their sugar. The American Beverage Association says that the average American consumes 54 gallons of soft drinks a year. That uh, calculates out to about 20 to 21 percent of the daily calorie intake. And uh, there are several research studies that actually show that sweetened beverages may enhance calorie overconsumption. And if you think diet beverages get folks off the hook, uh, there's research to show that drinking a diet beverage versus a sweetened beverage promotes even more calorie overconsumption. Now, we've known, and the National Cancer Institute has promoted fruits and vegetables uh, is important in preventing uh, cancer, and we also know that it helps lower your risk of obesity. Less than 10% of Americans actually eat their five fruits and vegetables a day, which has been the goal of the National Cancer Institute, is to get everybody to eat at least five fruits and vegetables a day. Uh, and somebody did the math and found that, you know, women who ate less than two servings of fruit a day had a 25 Per, or who ate more than two servings a day had a 25% lower risk of obesity and it's even stronger if they actually eat their vegetables. Uh, and if you're interested in what the, the new guidelines are, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, has sort of taken over this and they've got a little website, fruitsandveggiesmatter.gov, and they've changed the recommendation from servings to cups. So now the recommendation is two to six and a half cups every day, and that works out to about four to 13 servings. 13 servings, because the serving was a half a cup, so they've just changed all this to cups. Okay, I want to tell you about a really interesting study that helps you to see how if you focus on positive dietary advice, helping people to eat fruits and vegetables, you can actually help negate their intake of all the things you'd like them to be off of, like the sugary drinks and the fats. This was a, a control study where they had families with one obese parent, non-obese children, and they uh, were divided into two groups for counseling over the period of a year, and they were not told that this was a diet, uh, a weight control study at all. And one group was told to decrease their high fat and high sugar foods. They lost 
5.4 pounds over the course of the year. Group two was uh, told to increase their fruits and vegetables. And not only did they lose 16.4 pounds, but their consumption of all those negative things, the high fat and the high sugar foods decreased. I think it's a good approach to take. Okay, we also know that uh, the risk of obesity uh, is related to how many times you eat. The number of eating episodes is inversely related to the risk of obesity. Those who eat four or more times a day have a 45% lower risk of obesity. And it, it, just like your mom said, breakfast really is the most important meal of the day. Those folks who eat breakfast generally have a higher energy intake but a lower body mass index. And those who skip breakfast burn 150 calories less per day. And that often helps uh, people get convinced that they actually might need to eat breakfast. <laughs> Uh, and if you think just driving through the drive through window for your breakfast is going to, going to help you out there, uh, that's not true because eating breakfast out can double the risk of obesity compared to eating breakfast at home. Uh, and, you know, that's in part because those restaurant meals average about 1,000 to 1,500 calories each. And, you know, uh, some states have the calories on menus. Uh, I know that's not true. Uh, in Kansas. And uh, there was an interesting study where women who eat out five times a week consume an average of 290 extra calories a day and that works out to 21 pounds a year. People need to be getting their sleep. Uh, the Nurses Health Study after 16 <coughs> years looked at and found that the uh, subjects who were getting five or fewer hours of sleep a night were more likely to have gained 30 pounds. And we know that habitual short sleep time is associated with an increased body mass index. So that there's all sorts of things going on in the sleep that resets a lot of hormones. And uh, with those short sleep cycles, it's going to affect glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity, cortisol, and then these appetite uh, regulating hormones as well. And just a little caveat on physical activity here, um, because they found that increased TV viewing time is associated with higher body mass index in adults and children. Probably no surprise there, but obesity is eight times more prevalent in those who watch more than 24 hours of TV a week. And just like less than 10% of Americans are engaged in uh, eating their five fruits and vegetables, less than 10% are also engaged, not engaged. Uh, less than 10% are engaged in any kind of vigorous exercise regularly. So what's recommended uh, is about two and a half hours of moderate intensity a week and one and a quarter hours of vigorous exercise weekly. For children, it's recommended that they get 30, at least 30 minutes daily. Adults kind of get off the hook. <laughs> now, let's, let's see what happens when folks have cancer and what may be uh, promoting reoccurrence. This was a study that looked at breast cancer survivors who had invasive but non-metastatic cancer. And after 6.3 years on follow-up, they found that for each five kilogram weight gain, there was a 13% increase in breast cancer specific mortality. And it was not modified by premenopausal status, body mass index, or smoking. In other words, you know, what they weighed didn't matter. It's the weight gain that mattered. And uh, needless to say, their increase in cardiovascular mortality uh, for the weight gain was even higher. There was a, there's a, this little pilot study uh, by a group that proposed a very strict dietary lifestyle with 10% or less of the calories from fat, a very plant-based diet uh, using a lot of soy. And they were looking at uh, what might be happening in low-risk prostate cancer. They didn't have a whole lot of subject, uh, 
but they, they were seeing a trend that with this kind of diet, they were having some modulation of the gene expression uh, that has roles in tumorogenesis. And uh, they had all sorts of other benefits, weight loss, lower blood pressure, and uh, better lipid profile. But uh, there will be more coming out about that, I'm sure. OK, colorectal cancer. This is a very interesting study from the US polyp prevention trial. Um, they, they've been going on for quite a while. And they've looked for these uh, dietary cofactors before and haven't found significance until they teased out the data and looked for the people who actually complied. And, and this is very, uh, I see this over and over in uh, diet studies. You start out with uh, instructing one group to eat a certain diet and another group to eat another kind of diet so that you can compare the two. And by the end of the study, they're kind of all eating the same thing. So it's a little hard to tease out the data. So what they did is they looked at the people who complied with the recommendations for a high fiber, high fruits, high vegetables, low fat diet. And they did find a 35% reduction of, of uh, adenomas compared with controls. And th they had had another report where they found that those who had the greatest increase in dry bean consumption had also reduced adenoma reoccurrence. Now, dry beans are your legumes, you know, your beans and your <coughs> peas. Uh, which have all sorts of uh, wonderful uh, phytochemicals and a lot of fiber. Uh, one <coughs> cup of beans has eight grams of fiber. So it's w one of your most power-packed fiber foods. Now this, this brings us to this interesting study where um, they looked at stage three colon cancer patients. They followed them for 5.3 years. And they divided them up in groups as to what their dietary patterns were. And this, this Western diet, they called it, were, were people eating red and processed meats, sweets and desserts, French fries, and refined grains, which pretty much describes the American diet. <laughs> and they did find that this was associated with colon cancer reoccurrences or death. On the other hand, what they called the prudent diet, when uh, subjects were eating fruits, vegetables, legumes, fish, poultry, and whole grains, there was not an association with the colon cancer reoccurrence or death. So that's the prudent diet that they observed, vegetables, <coughs> fruits, legumes, whole grains, fish and poultry. And we might even think in terms of some seeds and nuts and that as well. Now what we do at the center is like the prudent diet, we are, we are encouraging people to eat whole foods, uh, especially colorful vegetables. They're fruits in whole form, no added sugar, and the wholesome low glycemic whole foods, which are your non-starchy vegetables. They're pretty much a glycemic free food. Uh, whole fruits, with the exception of the banana, and uh, <coughs> legumes and nuts. We also, of course, have that lovely organic garden and uh, the opportunity for people to go to the farmer's market here and also get organic foods. What we all do here is uh, a food sensitivity testing. And we help guide people, all, all our patients, cancer patients included, to avoid foods that they're sensitive to for a period of time. Food may be the greatest antigen challenge to your immune system. And it's very helpful to have those eliminated. And just to discuss a little bit of the, about what we do, this, uh, since we have an immune response to food, it, it, uh, most of those are like delayed sensitivities. 60 to 80 percent of the food sensitivities are delayed. People usually know when they have an acute allergy uh, to a food because they've had that 911 moment when their throat swells shut immediately. But these delayed ones, uh, the reaction may happen anywhere from 2 to 72 hours later. So it's sort of hard to figure out what was the offending uh, food a while back. And it affects every organ of the, of the body. 
And when we do the test, we're actually looking at uh, the patient's blood with these different foods. Um, and, and, and how the patient manifests these is very much an individual uh, reaction because any tissue, organ, or system can be affected by food sensitivities. So we try to help guide people uh, away from their food sensitivities. And what happens is it, it helps guide them towards whole foods that they probably may not have eaten much before. Because I have to get off, you know, if you're sensitive to corn, you have to get off high fructose corn syrup too. So just to sort of, what are whole foods? Well, frankly, they're the way nature put together foods. You know, it'll be plants, animals, fish, fungi, algae, even insects, although we don't serve those very often. <laughs> but the nice thing about your plants is, um, and your whole foods, the, those organisms have all the metabolic machinery to keep themselves going and reproducing. And so they, in turn, provide us with those uh, molecules that we need to keep going. So uh, nearly all uh, cells on Earth use and, and need all the same nutrients that our cells uh, need. And nearly the only foods available in nature are whole foods. Okay, so what are non-whole foods? Well, those are things that are grown, perhaps, but they're eaten after a complete nutrient or almost complete nutrient wash. You're refined foods. Uh, they don't exist in nature, except honey is, is the exception. Um, although you could argue it is a refined food because it's the bees who are doing the refining. But in, in the United States, 60% of the calories come from refined foods, refined sugars, uh, that is including sucrose, because Americans now consume 60% of their sugars from fructose and uh, only 40% from sucrose now. It also includes their separated fats and oils, which is anything from margarine to, to oil and, and lard, and <clears throat> uh, a big consumption, of course, white flour and white rice. And as uh, our colleague Don Davis, who lectures on whole foods, was a colleague of mine back in Dr. Williams' lab, uh, he sums it all up and says Americans are eating cookie dough. Because those are your ingredients, white flour, <laughs> some fat, and some sugar. And that's 60% of calories. So uh, Americans aren't, aren't uh, towing the line when it comes to whole foods. And there's a lot of other things about whole foods. You know, all these wonderful uh, phytonutrients. Uh, we call them phytochemicals to kind of embrace as many as uh, they keep discovering. And if you're interested in research that's going on with these and uh, cancer, the United States Department of Agricultural has this uh, research site. And uh, they're looking into things like lycopene, uh, from your tomatoes and the indole 3 carbonyl and sulforaphane from broccoli, the elagic acid and quercetin from uh, strawberries, resveratrol from the red grapes, curcumin, of course, from that lovely turmeric spice. Carnosol is from rosemary, another very pungent spice. Uh, the polyphenols from green tea they're looking into, and the isoflavones from um, like your soy. So, high sucrose consumption, not good. Uh, cancer cells use glucose for fuel, we know that. Warburg figured it out in 1955. Uh, and uh, a new study was looking at mice. This was an interesting. They had one group on a high sucrose diet, and the other group was getting a cornstarch diet. And they did find that the high sucrose rats were having more problems with intestinal epithelial cell proliferation and tumor generation, uh, not to mention increased serum glucose. And um, the other thing you have to think about in a high sugar diet is that uh, sugars are also going to interfere with the immune system, the ability of your neutrophils, for instance, to engulf bacteria. And, and Americans love their sugar. Uh, 150 pounds per year per person. That's 44 teaspoons a day, about 700 calories. That's a lot of sugar. And if you actually ate that in Whole Foods, you'd have to eat three bananas, three apples, or three grapes. I mean, <laughs> three grapes, and three oranges. So that, 
That's how much we're, uh, Americans are consuming in refined, what we call empty calories, because they're there with no nutrient accompaniment. So we try to encourage people to use fruits as their sweeteners. And there's always folks who just got to have a little more sweetness than that. Uh, so with moderation, uh, there's possibly options of some of these uh, other sweeteners like xylitol, which is a hemicellulose, has antibacterial properties, glycine, which is a non-essential amino acid, and uh, steviocide from stevia. I think the jury's still out on stevia, so I left that one last there. I did a whole lecture on sweeteners, and I was a little, <coughs> little puzzled by uh, the fact that stevia is not embraced worldwide. <coughs> so like I said, jury's still out. Now, this was a really fascinating study done in Korea because they, they did a 10-year follow-up on 1.3 million Koreans. So this is, this is a big study. And what, what they found was elevated fasting serum glucose was associated with a 31% in, 31 increase in mortality from cancer. For women, this was particularly true in pancreatic cancer, liver, and cervical. Uh, there was a 27% increase uh, for men, especially pancreatic, esophageal, liver, colon, and rectal. And these were for, the trend broke at about 110 milligrams per deciliter blood sugar result, um, which is elevated. We now have our standard where we like to see the blood sugars under 100. Now, the, the thing that I found a little disturbing was these were all fairly normal weight people. The, their study population, their <coughs> BMI was 23.2. Only a quarter had a BMI greater than 25. Well, uh, 60, over 60% 60 of Americans have a BMI greater than 25. So, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's talk a little bit about the glycemic effect of foods. Um, when you eat a carbohydrate containing food, the glycemic effect is defined as that effect on your blood glucose response and your insulin response. <clears throat> and foods that contain little or no carbohydrate do not have a glycemic effect. That's like your meats, your fish, your eggs, uh, avocados are so dense. That, um, and actually most uh, non-starchy vegetables don't have very little uh, glycemic effect. And, and the glycemic effect is used to help people with weight loss and uh, factors like diabetes and heart disease. And now we can see cancer risk is going to be important. Now just a little, a little info about the glycemic index and glycemic low, just to kind of straighten that out. The glycemic index is actually the test data. What they do is they give people 50 grams of a carbohydrate containing food and then they see what their blood sugar does and they map uh, the area under the curve. Okay, <coughs> but what we actually, the number of carbohydrates we actually might eat in a serving is not necessarily 50 grams. So they've converted the glycemic index into the glycemic load. And that's really what you'll be wanting to look at is the glycemic load, and there's the calculation. Okay, and so it's lower numbers are better. The glycemic index, it ranges like from 50, five or less uh, for low and 70 or better for high. And then if you look at the actual interpretation uh, with the glycemic load, a low glycemic load food is 10 or less, and a high glycemic load food is 20 or more. So just to kind of uh, raise your consciousness here, for instance, watermelon is a high glycemic index food because when they had to feed the test subjects, 50 grams of carbohydrate from watermelon, they had to feed them six and a half cups of watermelon. So uh, that did have an effect on the blood sugar. But a serving is supposed to be a cup and a quarter. And when that's calculated, it brings, you know, that's a smaller amount than six and a half. That brings your glycemic load down to eight. 
So that's kind of the way a lot of the fruits stack out, uh, except for the banana. It, it is still considered a, uh, not considered a low glycemic food. It's not exactly a high, it's, it's considered a moderate glycemic. Uh, because a serving of a banana, that's a half a banana, uh, gets you to a 10 on the glycemic load. And uh, if you'll just kind of glance at, you know, some of the whole grains like popcorn, if you're only eating two cups, that's a low glycemic load. Uh, you got to watch out for the grains. Uh, even, even if it's 100% shredded wheat it's, and, and potatoes, poor potatoes, they don't work out very well, and even sweet potatoes. Um, actually, new potatoes are a little bit better than white, regular Idaho white potatoes, and then sweet potatoes still have a little bit of that uh, higher glycemic load. Now, that, and especially true, high, really high glycemic loads with uh, grains, Quinoa is, is a big exception because it's a very high protein grain. So if you were only eating uh, like a three ounce serving, that's, that's a low glycemic load. And uh, nuts are pretty much very, very low. And all your legumes, they, they're very low. Uh, and one of your lowest is the carrot. And I, the reason I put it on there is because originally the data that was published was wrong. They said that carrot was a high glycemic food. Well, they, they, this, this is the problem with publishing your data before you've checked it again. <laughs> the word got out. Everybody said, oh my gosh, these carrots. I can't eat carrots. They're just going to you know, rocket my blood sugar. Well, they went back to the lab, looked, you know, redid the data, and lo and behold, that darn carrot is a low glycemic index and practically non-existent glycemic load. It's so low. So carrots are back in the diet. Now I just want to just make a quick mention about our, the fats in our diet. We've had this big shift where we're heavily eating omega-6 fatty acids versus the omega-3 fatty acids, which are our anti-inflammatory amino or fatty acids. And what's interesting is our increased consumption of omega-6 fatty acids is coming from the linoleic that's like in corn oil and soybean oil. But um, the average American, their omega-3 fatty acids are coming from canola and soybean oil in the form of the alpha linolenic. So when you even see this 20 to 1 ratio, that doesn't mean that, the, that you know, one person to the other 20 is actually uh, getting the, the fish oils. Well, it's not exactly a person ratio, but uh, it, the omega-3 consumption is coming also from our vegetable oils. We're a heavy vegetable oil consuming uh, crowd. And we're not doing much in the way of the uh, omega-3 fish. Or pasture-fed meat, which has a better fat profile than your corn-fed sitting around on their little hooves uh, stockyard uh, beef. <laughs> I was born in Hereford. I know exactly what that whole mess looks like, the whole town surrounded by feedlots. And it smells like it, too. Uh, the, just a quick reminder of uh, what your big hitters are when it comes to those lovely uh, EPA, that's EPA up there, uh, fats. Uh, you got your big fish. There's a little oyster there. Uh, even rainbow trout comes out pretty good. Uh, let's say sardines are right there, little fish. Um, this is your DHA, big hitters, uh, salmon again, brain, you know, you know how DHA is very important for brain development. If you were really brave, you could get some DHA from a brain. Uh, there's some sar sardines, and trout come out pretty good too. All right, but there's that caveat on, uh, on eating fish, and this is the FDA warning. Don't eat shark, swordfish, king mackerel, tilefish. Um, and if you are, keep it, keep it down to a, a really dull roar. They uh, say five of the most commonly eaten fish that are low in mercury are things like shrimp and canned light tuna, uh, salmon, pollock, and catfish. Catfish is not a big omega-3 fish. Neither a shrimp, really. But uh, they have a warning about uh, pregnant women eating albacore tuna. So it's that big albacore tuna that seems to uh, accumulate more mercury and should be eaten less often. And I'm just going to throw out here about clean food. We had a really good lecture on uh, genetically 
Modified Foods by Dr. Don Davis. If you're interested, we have some lunch and lectures up in the Gift of Health uh, that cover a lot of the uh, things right here towards the end about uh, clean food. And uh, they, you know, I, it helped straighten it out for me because I'm just, I'm thinking, well, you know, we've been breeding plants for years. You know, that's what they cross one variety with another variety, but genetically modified means they're actually taking genes from some uh, organism that's not related to the food that they're, or plant that they're about to put it in. So it's, it's, it's still pretty questionable and it's, and it's outlawed in a lot of countries anyway, except here, of course. Um, and we still allow bovine growth hormone too, uh, which is banned in Canada. You guys are way ahead of us. And uh, Japan, way ahead of us, and a bunch of other countries. So if you want to eat clean foods, uh, besides getting dairy products that uh, are organic, so they're not genetically, uh, or you don't have the uh, growth hormone problems, uh, you, some, some do some voluntary labeling, but anything that's organic will be non-GMO. It cannot be labeled organic and have GMO uh, cofactors or plants or products in it. But the big, the big GMO foods are like corn and corn products, except they haven't messed evidently with sweet corn and popcorn yet. Uh, soy and soy products, canola and cottonseed oils, and beet sugar. Uh, cane sugar evidently they haven't messed with yet either. And that's the lecture I was talking about. Okay, just a little blurb on organic. <laughs> organic food is powerful food. You know, you think of organic, yeah, you're going to get less pesticides, residues. Well, you are, uh, but organic foods have higher levels of antioxidants and phytochemicals, and they will help us in our fight uh, against cancer. And here's why, for all of you who like gardening and plants, you know, it's logical. A plant that is not helped out by pesticides and fungicides has to produce all sorts of phytochemicals to, uh, to fight off, you know, the bugs, the fungus, um, other, uh, other plants, animals. And when you help it along, the non-organic plants are not under attack. So they don't have these anti-predatory compounds and therefore they have fewer phytochemicals. And these, we get the health benefits from eating organic foods because of the phytochemicals that they are producing to survive. They need to reproduce. There was a really interesting study where somebody actually looked at strawberries uh, in, in cell culture with colon cancer cells and breast cancer cells. Now, just conventionally str grown strawberries did actually decrease the growth of cancer cells by 30 to 50 percent, depending on the amount of the strawberry that they put in there, uh, the more, the more uh, suppression of growth. Okay, they took the same varieties and they grew them organically and did the same test and it was an even stronger suppression. They actually looked at eight antioxidants as well and antioxidants didn't matter. It was whether the food was grown organically. They had only 70 to 85 percent as much growth with the organic compared to the conventional. And uh, there's some nice bar graphs uh, <laughs> that, that demonstrate that. Uh, one last word, <laughs> cooking. It's very important not to overheat. Uh, you don't want to char charcoal, charboil. You don't want to overheat your oils. Uh, it's very questionable whether you want to use nonstick pans because they've found Teflon uh, floating around in people. And uh, if, if folks want a microwave, no plastic. Uh, no plastic wraps, no plastic containers, and don't, you know, don't burn it to a crisp in the microwave. All right. Well, I enjoyed it. Everybody enjoy whole and organic foods. Thank you. Okay, we have... We're going to start the list around for if you want to be on the email list and contact list. So please mark that. Couple, couple, time for a couple questions. Dr. Kirby, our scores really high on our lecture lectures, and now you can see why she's an excellent lecture. Touchdown. Uh, Touchdown. I just want, <laughs> I want to do, uh, say, uh, you might take a look if you're interested in more in-depth on any of these topics from 
you know, organic to omega-3, so the glycemic index. Uh, we have a bunch of the lunch or lecture tapes by different folks. 857 lunch and lectures in the last 20, 20 years, yes. Wow. Is your opinion um, that soy is all right if it's um, whole soybeans and organic? She's, she's asking about soy. Is it okay if it's whole and organic? You know, soy is really somewhat controversial, and organic is good, non-GMO is good if you can get it. And I think for women who have breast cancer, soy might be kind of, you know, verboten, you know, not so good. But for other folks who want to have a plant-based diet, and use uh, soy as a one of their uh, big protein foods. I think that's doable. I, I yeah. heard that you try not to have more than two servings in a day. Well, you know, the other thing is variety is so important uh, that people not get fixated on you know a few foods. That, that's one reason I put that fruit and veggies matter. Uh, website up there because they'll just give you a long list of fruits and vegetables because sometimes people just think about broccoli as a vegetable and they can't come up with other vegetables and it's good to just you know help them go for variety. Did you know you can you can tell whether it's organic or genetically modified in the store by the number that's on it. Oh with the little with the little yeah, tag if thing? Got, if it's got a nine in front of it it's organic. If it's got an eight it's genetically modified, it's just a four-digit number that's just routinely grown. Mm -hmm. So nine is organic, eight, eight is, is genetically modified. The first annual Reardon IVC and Cancer Symposium was brought to you by the Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International, located at 3100 North Hillside, Wichita, Kansas, USA. To learn more about the center and what we have to offer, please visit us on the web at www.brightspot.org.